Chapter 18. Asymmetric Sniping. Guerrilla Tactics plus Heavy Caliber Rifles equals Asymmetric Sniping. While close-in sniper shots like that of Juba are the hallmark of urban warfare, longer distance ones are possible. For instance, during the siege of Sarajevo, the Serbians dug into the surrounding hills could take shots into the city from a mile away. Also, sometimes the urban terrain lends itself to a long shot. Every city, with their deliberately planned layout, has straightaways of varying distances that can be used to make a long shot. We must remember that using an elevated firing position allows the sniper to shoot over urban obstacles to make long distance shots. Think of the German and Russian snipers firing from the smokestacks of Stalingrad's factory district, giving them a mile of observation in all directions. Along with extreme range, a heavy caliber sniper rifle will penetrate urban mediums like steel, concrete, glass, and wood. This means normal sniper countermeasures like staying behind bulletproof glass and traveling in armored vehicles no longer provides protection. In fact, when a large caliber's rifle penetrating power is combined its long range, most counter sniper measures are rendered ineffective. The ability to penetrate and accurately hit intended targets at distance also means a heavy sniper rifle can be used to attack just about anything like planes, helicopters, boats, armored cars, tanks, and fuel farms. Consequently, the lone gunman using a heavy caliber sniper rifle against ill-protected targets is truly an example of asymmetric warfare. How else could a single person immobilize a warship, destroy a stealth bomber, or render ineffective a nuclear submarine? A brief history of heavy sniping. Modern heavy caliber sniper rifles are the product of several historical influences. One of the first heavy caliber rifles used in modern warfare was the Germans 13.2 mm anti-tank rifle made by Mauser. The drive to develop this large weapon originated with the German army's frustration in dealing with the French and British tanks, which deflected normal sized bullets. In response, Mauser developed their bolt-action anti-tank rifle in early 1918. However, the Germans used their 13.2mm behemoths for more than just anti-armor operations. They also targeted enemy snipers. Interestingly enough, after the war was over, the American military used captured Mauser 13.2mm rifles to test 50 caliber cartridges in their efforts to develop a new 50 caliber heavy machine gun. The British World War I snipers also used heavy caliber rifles from their trenches against the German foes, but for different reasons. The British had a problem with German snipers because the Germans began firing from behind prefabricated steel plates impervious to the British regular 303 caliber rounds. In order to defeat the German steel sniper shields, the British brought into country large caliber hunting rifles called elephant guns because they were originally used to hunt large game like elephants on the African plains. While heavy caliber rifles were in their infancy in the Great War, World War II saw a veritable explosion of anti-tank guns. The Germans produced their Panzerbusch 38 and 39 models, fielding tens of thousands of them against the Polish army in 1939, against the British in North Africa, and against the Russians on the Eastern Front. The British developed their boys .55 caliber anti-tank rifle in the late 1930s, which could penetrate about 20 millimeters of armor when fired perpendicular to the target. The Russians had their PRTD-41 bolt-action anti-tank rifle, which they used in large numbers on the Eastern Front. The PTRD-41 fired a 14.5 by 114 millimeter tungsten steel core round that could punch through 40 millimeters of vertical armor at a 90 degree angle, meaning it could penetrate the side armor of most German tanks at close range. A variety of other countries fielded anti-tank rifles as well, like Switzerland, Poland, Finland, and Japan. Ultimately, as tank armor grew in thickness, the man-portable anti-tank rifle became almost useless. However, by pure chance and sheer necessity, both the German and Russian sides on occasion tried using anti-tank guns for sniping. This was not widespread at the time because these anti-tank rifles were relatively crude, inaccurate, and not designed for use with a scope. Although the United States in World War I and II did not field anti-tank rifles, 
American soldiers did experiment with firing their M2 50 caliber machine guns on single shot with a scope. Perhaps the first 50 caliber rifle intended specifically for sniping was fabricated in 1946 by Frank Conway, an ordnance officer stationed at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland. Conway took a German Panzerbusch 39, replaced the existing barrel with a 50 caliber machine gun barrel, added a muzzle brake, attached a bipod near the muzzle, and added a scope. With this custom sniper system, Conway could hit targets at 1,400 yards and place rounds through a building's window at 2,800 yards. Despite these successes, little official interest was generated in the 50 caliber sniping rifle concept. The weapons seemed too large, crude, and unorthodox for the Army's conventionally minded military leaders. During the Korean War, the Marine Corps recognized the usefulness of large caliber sniping, and the 1st Marine Division included sniping with a 50 caliber M2 machine gun in their curriculum. Major Hicks, USMC, stated, Each student trained not only with the 30 caliber M1 rifle, or the 03 Springfield, depending on his preference, but also with the 50 caliber machine gun fired single shot. Scopes were mounted on the machine guns, and they proved to be effective for ranges up to and beyond 1,200 yards. Once again, just like during World War II, some snipers were dissatisfied with the effectiveness of their current sniper weapons at long range. As a result, an enterprising young captain by the name of William S. Brophy fabricated his own long-range sniper rifle. Brophy, who was an American ordnance officer, took a 50 caliber aircraft machine gun barrel and attached it to the frame of a Russian PTRD-41 anti-tank gun, which was captured from the Korean and Chinese forces and added a bipod and a 20x power scope. While field testing this new rifle in Korea, Brophy and his students made kills out to a range of 2,000 yards. Even after further testing and evaluation, the heavy caliber sniper rifle never caught on with the U.S. military and American soldiers fighting in Vietnam in the 1960s and 70s had to make do with firing single shots from their M2 heavy barreled machine guns. Breaking the Mold, the 50 caliber sniper rifle. While the U.S. saw military showed no interest in designing a long-range heavy caliber sniper rifle, a private businessman named Ronnie Barrett did. Barrett saw the need for a mobile, accurate, large caliber sniper rifle and was intent on designing and manufacturing one. In 1982, after working on a design in his garage workshop, Barrett fabricated his own 50 caliber sniper rifle. This groundbreaking design would later become the Model 82A1. The M82 proved to be a breakthrough and, even though the weapon was big, it had a very low recoil, was easy to use, and could hit targets accurately at a mile and more. Barrett finally proved you could fabricate a purpose-built 50 caliber sniper rifle with the desired results in accuracy and range. After refining his original product, Barrett garnered some interest from the US military as well as private shooting enthusiasts. The Marines employed 50 caliber sniper rifles while deployed to Beirut in 1983 and a Navy SEAL unit used 50 caliber rifles during the invasion of Grenada in the same year. After the M82 proved itself over the ensuing years, especially during the first Gulf War, manufacturers all over the world began to produce their own versions of the 50 caliber sniper rifle. While Barrett had the market cornered for the first years after his initial design, today there is a veritable flood of similar weapons. Russia now has a heavy caliber sniper rifle, as does South Africa, Austria, Britain, and Germany, just to name a few. Also, a whole new crop of American arms companies has bloomed, all producing their own versions of the heavy caliber sniper rifle. In 2005, the U.S. Army officially designated Barrett's XM-107, a slightly modified version of the original M82, as its long-range sniping rifle. After nearly 60 years of innovation, field testing, and varying degrees of official apathy going as far back as 1946, the U.S. military finally recognized the value of a heavy caliber sniping rifle. 20mm and 25mm rifles While anti-tank guns like the German Panzerbusch 39 were of relatively small caliber and the PTRD-41 was only 14.5mm in size, some countries went even bigger. For instance, the Finnish military produced the Lati 20mm anti-tank rifle in 1939. The Lati proved to be successful against Russia's light tanks out to a distance of 400 meters, and, due to its accuracy, it was also used for smaller targets like machine gun nests and enemy bunkers. 
The lati was a large weapon weighing over 100 pounds and was pulled on a sled in snowy conditions. The Japanese of World War II also produced a 20mm anti-tank rifle, the Type 97, which weighed in at over 130 pounds and could penetrate more than an inch of steel at 300 meters. The Japanese Imperial Army only fielded several hundred of these enormous weapons, which required at least two men to manhandle them. The 20mm anti-tank rifle died a quick death after the war, but saw a comeback in recent times where modern manufacturing methods have produced lightweight, man-portable weapons that can be carried and employed by a single person. In the early 1990s, South Africa developed the NTW-20 anti-material rifle, and in 1998, the South African National Defense Force began fielding it in numbers. The NTW-20 has a range of over 1,500 meters, and at a weight of about 57 pounds, the rifle can be broken down into two equal size loads. It is truly man-portable. At about the same time, Croatia, which was engaged in an ugly war with neighboring Serbia, developed its RT-20 anti-materiel slash anti-tank rifle. The RT-20 fires a high-velocity 2,000 grain 20mm round at speeds of 2,500 feet per second. This high-powered round, which can reach out to 1,800 meters, produces a great deal of recoil which is dampened by a special recoil tube fitted above the receiver. This single-shot, bolt-action rifle is considerably lighter than the NT-20 and weighs in at only 45 pounds. Perhaps the best 20mm rifle out there is Anzio Ironworks 20mm takedown rifle, which weighs only 39 pounds. The Anzio takedown fires a 20mm Vulcan round that weighs 1,600 grains and travels at a velocity of 3,300 feet per second. Believe it or not, when the Anzio takedown is fitted with a sound suppressor, it has relatively little recoil or muzzle flash. Especially important for the sniper who needs to conceal their activities, the Anzio 20 millimeter rifle comes with a custom carrying case, which the weapon fits in when disassembled. With the growth and popularity of the 50 caliber and 20 millimeter models, there was enough interest to produce an even larger anti-material rifle of the 25 millimeter size. The 25 millimeter rifle is an elite category because few such models are available for retail. When one talks about 25 millimeter rifles, they are really talking about Ronnie Barrett's XM109, which is a modification of the original M82. Essentially, the XM109 is an M82 with a different upper receiver. The XM109 is truly in a class of its own. Weighing in at a slim 33 pounds, it fires a 25mm HEDP round, high explosive dual purpose, has a range of 2500 meters, and can penetrate 40 millimeters of armor out to 500 meters. The modern heavy caliber sniper rifle has come a long way since Mauser's original 13.2mm design in World War II. Anti-material sniping. Modern heavy caliber sniper rifles began as anti-tank weapons. However, as the armor of tanks and other armored vehicles improved during World War II, the anti-tank rifle grew out of favor and was not effective considering its weight and relative inaccuracy. Now, with the design of modern heavy caliber rifles that have excellent range, good penetrating power, and can be disassembled and carried by a single person, the old anti-tank gun is back in vogue. With these new lightweight models, the modern urban sniper has a whole range of targets that can disable or eliminate with accurate aimed fire. One of the primary targets for the modern heavy caliber sniper is the armored vehicle, for which it was first created. At first, one might not think a main battle tank would be vulnerable to the humble, humble sniper rifle, but through study and intelligent shot placement, the urban sniper can immobilize a heavy tank. First, a tank can only protect its crew if they are actually inside the vehicle. Since a tank can get extremely hot inside, tank crew members often ride on the top of their vehicles or open up the access hatches to let in air in the vehicle in order to cool off. And because armored vehicles offer their crews such poor visibility of the surrounding urban terrain, tank drivers and tank commanders often stick their heads out of the hatches in order to see better. On other occasions, crew members open their hatches and expose themselves when talking to other ground soldiers. For whatever reason crew members expose themselves, they become targets. During the battle for Stalingrad, Russian snipers intentionally waited for panzer crew members to expose themselves so they could be picked off. This practice hurt the Germans because trained panzer crews were extremely valuable and hard to replace because of the large numbers of casualties suffered in the Stalingrad slaughterhouse. 
Sixty years later, American tank crewmen in Iraq found themselves prime targets for insurgent snipers as they stuck their heads out of their hatches to watch for the enemy. The urban sniping, taking careful aim at the main battle tank, is a true example of asymmetric warfare where the tank, which is designed for high-intensity warfare, is incapable of detecting and surgically eliminating a carefully hidden sniper who takes advantage of the city's urban clutter. I had the chance to talk to members of an Abrams tank unit in Iraq who were victim of an insurgent sniper attack. When the incident happened, the tank unit was patrolling an area. As they drove slowly down a road, the driver had his head of that, out of the hatch so he could see the narrow road better. Unknown to the unit, a small insurgent element had set up an ambush site in the cluster of buildings near the road. As the tank approached the buildings, the sniper opened fire and shot the driver of the tank, killing him. The insurgents then ran out of the buildings, swam a nearby canal, jumped into a waiting car, and drove off. The tank unit was unable to detect the hidden sniper before the attack, they never saw the shooter make the shot, and they were unable to pursue their attackers because the cluster of buildings provided the insurgents with visual screening until they were safely across the water and into their car. What was the tank unit supposed to do now? There was nobody to blow up with their 120mm cannons. Also, the unit had to treat their wounded man, which meant they had to immediately leave the area and go to a nearby aid station. Shooting an armored vehicle crew member is pretty easy. If the sniper sees a person, they shoot them. On the other hand, learning to physically disable a main battle tank takes homework, and the sniper must know the vulnerable points of the vehicle. The sniper can learn this any number of ways, like buying books about their target or reading articles on the internet. One way to get an intimate understanding of an armored vehicle is to build a plastic model of it, like the ones at hobby shops. Oftentimes, these model kits offer the builder more detailed knowledge of the vehicle than reading any book. Common vulnerable points on armored vehicles include vision ports, thermal imaging sites, engine compartments, and the vehicle's roof, especially where the access hatches are. If a sniper shoots out the vision port, driving becomes difficult for the crew and they may have to stick their heads out to sea, making them even more vulnerable to follow on shots. Shooting out thermal imagers and other weapon targeting systems will immobilize the vehicle's main gun, making them less of a threat if a sniper has the chance. They can also shoot the vehicle from the rear, because that is traditionally where armored vehicles have the thinnest armor and is usually where the engine is located. So by hitting the engine compartment at the weak spot, a sniper can get a mobility kill on the vehicle. Finally, a sniper can try to get a top-down shot on a vehicle from an elevated position because the armor is thinner on top. There's usually a person. Wherever the hatch is. Consequently, the hatches make a convenient aiming point for the shooter. It is useful to understand the majority of the world's armored personnel carriers and armored trucks are designed only to stop shell fragments and 7.62 millimeter rounds and smaller. These armored personnel carriers cannot withstand 50 caliber sniper fire. Vehicles like Russia's BTR-60, 70, and 80 series only stop small arms fire and a 20mm rifle with armor-piercing ammunition will smoke right through the thin armor of a BTR like it was butter. With the advent of the lightweight, portable 20 and 25mm rifle, a single shooter can hide in a building, shoot through a small loophole, and defeat any armored vehicle out there short of a main battle tank. The takedown 20 and 25mm rifle combined with an urban setting gives the shooter a definite advantage over the light armored vehicles most of the world's armies use today. But let us be clear what we are talking about here. There are many exaggerated claims of what anti-material sniping can accomplish, and we must be realistic about a heavy rifle's capabilities. Only the informed surgical targeting of an armored vehicle will work. If a sniper shoots out a tank's thermal imaging system, the tank can still drive and fire its weapons, it just may not be able to fire accurately. A sniper may shoot and kill a tank commander, but the rest of the crew will still be able to maneuver their vehicle and fire their weapon systems. Most likely, an anti-tank sniper will inconvenience a tank or make the vehicle retreat for repairs or to help a wounded crew member. The sniper will probably not permanently disable the tank. In Stalingrad, Russian anti-tank riflemen shot up plenty of German panzers, but the Germans recovered the majority of them, repaired them, and sent them back into action. 
Some of these Russian anti-tank gunners were not so lucky the second and third times around, and were eventually gunned down by the panzers they already shot up, and disabled multiple times before.